All right. Uh, so this afternoon's event is part of Forsyth Tech's partnership with the Pulitzer Center that allows us to bring a journalist to campus each spring and fall semester. The speaker series is not the only benefit of our partnership with the Pulitzer Center. We're also able to offer a fellowship to one Forsyth Tech student each year, each year to, travel to travel anywhere in the world, world and, and to, uh, to learn and practice journalism. The fellowship pays for travel, food, and logic. To be eligible, students must be 18 or older in 2022 and enrolled during at least one semester of the 2021-2022 academic year. The next fellowship deadline will be at the end of January 2022. Sorry, 2022. If you'd like to learn more about the fellowship program or get on our mailing list, please email me, Chris Weaver, at cweaver at forsythetech.edu. I will put my email and a link with details on the program uh, in the chat box uh, so you can find information that way, so you can get, get in touch with us. It is an amazing opportunity, and I hope that you will consider applying. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to let you know that we will have a question and answer session after the presentation. If you have any questions, please type them into the chat box, and I'll ask as many uh, questions as time allows on your behalf. To access the chat box, please click on the speech bubble in the upper middle of the screen. Um, it should be next to a participants button and another one that looks like a smiley face with a hand held up. Uh, if you're using the, the app uh, or the, the software, it may look a little different if you're on the web interface. Um, if someone asks a question that you like, give it a thumbs up uh, so that I can make sure that I get to the most popular questions. Uh, without further ado, I will go ahead and introduce today's speaker. Maria Inez Samudio covers immigration for WBEZ. She's an award-winning investigative reporter who's now part of the race, class, and communities team. Prior to joining WBEZ, she worked for American Public Media's investigative team. She's also worked as an investigative reporter for the Memphis Commercial Appeal and Chicago Reporter Magazine. In 2015, Samudio and a team of reporters from NPR's Latino USA received a Peabody National Award for the coverage of Central American migrants. Samudio's story was reported from the Mexico-Guatemala border, and it focused on the danger women from Central America face while traveling through Mexico as they try to reach the United States. Her work has appeared in the Associated Press, the New York Times, National Public Radio, NBC5 Chicago, Telemundo, and Univision, among others. Welcome, Maria Ines. Hi, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm really excited to be part of this um, conversation. I came across the Pulitzer Center a few years ago. They actually supported one of my previous uh, stories uh, related to deported veterans. So I'm really excited to be here with you all and talk about um, some of the things that we've been covering during the pandemic. So what I wanted to do is start off with an overview of how I've approached reporting during this pandemic. Um, I'm part of the Race, Class, and Communities team at WBEZ. It's the Chicago NPR station. And so what we really wanted to do is really get an understanding and really report out how the pandemic was hitting the most vulnerable communities in Chicago. And so I want to just kind of go over some of the things that I've done in the past year to get to the vaccine rollout and the things that we're doing now. So um, let's see, make sure that I, you all can see this. Um, so you might have seen the story. It, it went viral here in Chicago, and it really started the conversation about the racial disparities when it comes to uh, the deaths because of COVID-19. So I did this story back in April. We were you know, very new into the pandemic, we analyzed death records and found something really disturbing. We found that COVID-19 was killing Black uh, residents in Cook County at disproportionately high rates. And um, the really shocking number was 70% of the COVID-19 deaths were really concentrated in, in, in Black Chicagoans, even though they only accounted for 29% of the population. We continued looking through some of the stories that dealt with uh, these vulnerable communities. We wanted to look at um, the things that played out and how 
both the city and the state responded to the pandemic. So one of the things very early on was testing. Um, so we looked at testing and we found that uh, testing was really lagging behind in Latino neighborhoods, despite the fact that um, they these neighborhoods and zip codes had the highest uh, positivity rates. And um, just to follow up on that, I just did a story this week uh, related to a study that was done um, that looked at the first six months of the pandemic and basically found the same thing, right? That the testing really lagged behind in, in Black and Latino communities in three cities, in Chicago, New York, and Philadelphia. Those are the, the cities that um, they looked at. Um, so it kind of just, it, it was really, um, it was really interesting to follow up on that story that I had done uh, last year. Um, we also looked at the ways in which COVID-19 was impacting communities of color, not only in the health aspect, but also um, money, right? Because a lot of people lost their jobs and we wanted to understand how that played out. So NPR um, actually did a poll, a national poll that looked at um, how households were faring um, during the pandemic when it comes to their financial security. And so the NPR poll found that black households in Chicago um, and Latino households in Chicago were uh, reporting very serious financial problems compared to white households. And so I was doing a story about, you know, how, what that looks like and um, in Chicago. Um, one of the things that I've also have uh, try to keep tabs on is um, the water crisis in Chicago. A few years ago, I did a story about um, the rising cost of water along the Great Lakes region. So I looked at um, water rates across five cities in uh, the Great Lakes region. So Chicago, uh, Detroit, Cleveland, uh, Duluth, Minnesota, uh, Buffalo. And what we found um, during that decade is that the, the cost of water rose uh, very consistently through, throughout the decade. And what that uh, meant is that some people weren't able to afford getting that water. And so we, uh, we, were, we were getting shut off data for all of those cities and found the same thing, right? We found that um, in Black and Latino neighborhoods in every single one of those cities, um, they had disproportionate uh, high rates of, of water shutoffs. So it was important for me to continue um, reporting the story out. And what I found is that the city had no idea how many people um, had their water disconnected because when the new mayor of Chicago came in, she issued a uh, water shutoff moratorium after our investigation published. And, um, but, what happened is this like really weird thing where um, anyone who had their water disconnected prior to May of 2019 and had a large water debt, um, they, some of them weren't able to get their water reconnected. So going into the pandemic, there's people already, you know, living without water. And so I was able to interview some of the folks who are uh, living, without, uh, living without water. And, and we get a sense of what they have to go through, um, specifically during a pandemic where every health official was saying, the way to keep you safe is by washing your hands. But how do you wash your hands if you don't have water in your home? Um, so that was an important story that I wanted to, to make sure that I got to. Um, as soon as we started seeing the disparities in the death rates, we wanted to understand what was happening in Chicago. And so these early indicators of um, racial disparities led a team of uh, WBEZ reporters, my colleagues, to really spend some time thinking about um, how to tell these stories in a more um, comprehensive way. So we spent about two months reaching hundreds of relatives of Chicagoans who have died of COVID-19 uh, between March 16 and May 9th of 2020. And we created a survey um, that dealt with some of the issues that we were reporting on in these uh, communities. So we focused on four zip codes, 
one of the zip codes was um, the South Shore community in the south side of Chicago, which had the highest death rate of um, of any community in Chicago. And the 60623 zip code, which is essentially um, half of it is um, primarily uh, a Mexican immigrant community and half of it is um, the North Lawndale neighborhood, which is primarily black. And that specific um, zip code had the highest infection rate. Um, and so we were trying to understand what were some of the contributing factors that led to those numbers? So we looked at things like access to a hospital, um, experiences with those community hospitals before that and how that how those experiences played out during the pandemic. For example, um, I, you know, it is as part of my, my story, it looked at one of the community hospitals, St. Anthony, St. Anthony Hospital in the Little Village community, which um, had a lot of issues in the past in terms of like the community distrusted that that hospital um and that led to some community members not wanting to go seek for help when they got covid so i actually interviewed a couple of family members whose uh, relative died at home because they were trying to avoid going to that hospital so you can really understand the distrust uh, from community members to to some of those institutions. We also looked at things like how uh, being able to work from home played a, a big role in the spread of the virus. Um, Multi-generational households and how that had an impact on the spread of the virus. And so that's how we got to, to this story that I am going to talk about more. Um, and that is that when we started planning a coverage around the the rollout of the vaccine. We wanted to be really intentional about covering some of the disparities because we knew from the get go that the the community's hardest hits by the pandemic also lacked pharmacies, also lacked a lot of them didn't have a primary care doctor. A lot of them didn't have access to internet, right? So there was already all of these built-in um, barriers to access. And so it was really important for us to get to that. Um, so the first story I did for, for that team was really looking at information. Um, and so I did a, a feature about uh, promotoras de salud or community health workers and how these community members were going out to the neighborhoods hardest hit by the pandemic and really trying to have a dialogue with community members there around how to stop the spread of the virus, um, and just really understanding where the knowledge gap was because there are you know we used to have a spanish language newspaper here in chicago we, we used to have a, a number of them and they're mostly gone and so there is a big um, gap in terms of like information uh, that's available to these communities and so i wanted to really explore this model this like two-way model of like information flow and it's actually a conversation and um, also understanding that these promotoras de salud have a report with these community members they know that they know each other they trust each other and so i was really exploring this model um, one of the other stories i did um, i think like last week or a few weeks ago was looking at the digital divide right um, how um, communities in chicago have this d digital divide. For example, um, some communities in the south and west sides, for example, um, have very low rates of uh, having internet at home. And the main way in which this, both the city and the state have rolled out vaccine appointments is by having them online. Like you have to be able to book these vaccine appointments online. So um, I, I did a feature about um, to community members who launched a private um, effort to to help people find vaccination uh, appointments online. Um, I don't think I have a, a slide for that here, but um, yeah, I, I want to stop there because I just threw a lot at you. And so I want to just have a conversation with you all about um, 
some of the things that I've shared. Um, and um, in the past, I've had uh, some really interesting questions, um, so I would love to open it up for questions, if that's OK. Thank you very much. Um, so if you have questions, if you'd like to type them in the chat box. I haven't seen any yet. Or if you if you just really want to uh, to ask in person, that's fine too. I don't want that to prevent you from asking a question uh, if you'd prefer to ask that way. Uh, I just ask that if you would kindly uh, re-mute yourself after asking the question so that uh, everybody can uh, have the best viewing experience. Mm -hmm. You'd like think, to go first. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say one last thing. Um, when it comes to the vaccine rollout, um, it was really important for us to really take a look at who was getting the vaccine. So I am working with a team of reporters. They just did a story um, actually today that looks at um, vaccine, the, the doses of vaccines that were distributed by zip code. And so we, we already see a, a disproportionate um, number going to wealthier uh, communities in downtown versus the communities that were hardest hit. So I feel like a lot of this work is also just uh, watchdog reporting, right? Um, because we keep hearing from both the mayor, um, Lori Lightfoot, um, the governor, J.B. Pritzker, how they really wanted to have an equitable distribution of the vaccine. But it is one thing to, to wish that and say that, and it is a different thing to actually, you know, implement it in the rollout. And so, I think that what our team has been trying to really do is to like report on the issues that they should have known, right? Like there are uh, very few pharmacies in the south side of Chicago, the west side of Chicago, and there is a huge digital divide. So even in the implementation of, of these plans, there's already disparities built into it. So it was important for us to really highlight those. It is odd that it's surprising given that so many of the things you pointed out were structural problems that were in place long before this uh, that, yeah. that they could have been aware of. So I've got questions starting to roll in. Uh, so I'll start asking. Uh, Kimberly asks, uh, what are the promotores de salud uh, doing uh, that you think might make people more likely to get the vaccine? What's unique about uh, what they're doing that, that's reaching people in, in a way that other strategies aren't? Yeah. Um, so I first came across the model of uh, promotoras de salud or community health workers when I was working in California. It was my first job out of college. I was um, working in a small farming community in the Central Coast, Salinas, California, and uh, that's also known as the salad bowl of, of the U.S. basically because we get a lot of the fruits and vegetables from that community. And um, there were some community health workers that were doing um, work around heat strokes, right? Like really working with farm workers so they understood what kinds of things they needed to look out for to protect themselves from the heat and all of those things. And um, <clears throat> when I started working as part of the vaccine distribution team, I talk to a lot of people. I usually just talk to a lot of people before I pitch stories because I really want to understand, especially if I'm going into an area that I, have, I know nothing about. And so one of the things that kept popping up is that um, these community health workers were doing these extraordinary things like they were out in the community all the time trying to like provide information. And so I started learning more about the model here in Chicago. And I think that what is different is that it's a two way model, right? Like when you go to the, the doctor, it's a little bit intimidating, right? Like you ask maybe a question, a follow up, and you're just like sort of a little bit like, is this a dumb question? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to feel dumb. And so the, the two way model is basically like somebody from your community, you trust them. They got special training, so they have the information and you're just having a conversation. So it doesn't feel preachy. It doesn't feel um, unaccessible. It feels like you're having a conversation with a community member. And so I think that that is a really important key in this um, in this effort. 
Thank you. Uh, Annalena asks, what are some of the biggest ways that vaccine conspiracies have been spreading in Chicago? Um, I think they're basically very, very similar to every city in, in the U.S. Um, for the Spanish language community, for example, and that's part of the story, um, is that there's just a lack of like reliable information in Spanish. There's um, there's a there's two TV stations. There's like one or two radio stations, but they don't really do news. Right. Like it's it's very limited. So whenever there's like a gap in in services like usually some community members taking upon themselves to inform each other so what you would see a lot is um sp the spread of these like conspiracy theories um on on whatsapp it's a very popular app in latin america um you would see it in social media and i think that the community was also just sort of coming out of the trump era and, you know, I heard conspiracy theories about, you know, the president wants to kill us all. So, like, this is what he's doing. He got the vaccine, so he just wants to kill us, you know. So those kinds of um, conspiracy theories, like, really spread really quickly, especially when you've had a community that has felt um, attacked for the last four years. Um, so it it was just sort of like, a perfect combination of all these different things, fear, lack of good information, and then the community trying to sort of protect each other. And so they were, they thought they were sharing good, reliable information and it, it wasn't. Yeah. Laura asks, was there a response from local government officials and offices uh, to make changes uh, as a result of some of the stories uh, you, you worked yeah. on? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, back in April, when I did the story that looked at the racial disparities when it came to um, mortality rates. Um, so I did the story over the weekend. Um, I think we published it maybe like Sunday. I think it was Sunday, Saturday or Sunday, one of the two. And then by Monday, this uh, the mayor, uh, Lori Lightfoot, um, had a press conference. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, she's usually really nice. <laughs> um, so, so Lori Lightfoot had a press conference like that next Monday in which she announced an effort by the city uh, to targeting specific communities that were already seeing disparities in the number of cases and disparities in the number of deaths. And so she created these, um, so she partnered with uh, community organizations and nonprofits that were already doing work in that area to provide PPE, uh, to get more testing done, um, to basically throw more resources in those communities. Um, and, and that same model has been sort of um, built, so the same model has, has been built into the distribution of the vaccine. For example, the city has selected 15 community areas that they call the Protect Chicago Plus communities. And so this effort essentially um, is by the city and the city's partnering with community organizations to, to uh, create vaccination sites for that specific community. And so the goal is to vaccinate, I think it, don't quote me in this number, but I, I believe it's like 10% of that population in that community area uh, with this effort. And, and the idea behind this is that there's already a lot of barriers to getting the, the appointment to the vaccine. And these communities have been really hard hit by the pandemic. So let's just try to make it easier for that population to, to get the vaccine. Um, the the city also um, so there's a mass vaccination site in Chicago that opened uh, about three weeks ago uh, and is run by FEMA. Um, it's at the United Center. And when it was announced, the city gave, you know, a, a link for people to sign up for an appointment. But 
um, because of those barriers, 60%, like I think uh, within a few days of that opening up, the vast majority of the people getting the vaccine or vaccine appointments uh, were not from Chicago and they were mostly white. And so the city said, okay, we're gonna have to fix something, right? So um, they basically um, allowed some, zip, some people that live in specific zip codes to be able to register for the vaccine at the United Center. And so the city has tried to address some of those dis those disparities um, that we've pointed out in our reporting. Thank you, uh, Bill. Bill asks, what are we learning about best practices in connecting underserved communities to available and accessible vaccines? Yeah, we. Um, it's a really good question. So. We are like our team is currently trying to look at, at those issues at the moment. Uh, we recently had a meeting like our team. Uh, we have a team of three reporters and um, and my, I guess four reporters, including myself um, and two editors. And so we all met with um, a group, a community group. They call themselves the People's Response to COVID-19. And um, these are folks who live in these, you know, disenfranchised communities who have been uh, doing public health work for a really long time. And they came, they came up with this ordinance. Um, they call it bring the vaccines to the people. So one proposal that they're basically using is that um, the city should be using public buildings like schools. Uh, Chicago closed a lot of schools over the last few years. So they're saying use some of the, the, the sites of these schools to open up vaccination sites in communities that have, have been um, hit the hardest. Eliminate all the barriers, eliminate all of the barriers, the, the booking appointments, um, trying to get to the United Center, for example, if you are someone who lives in the south, uh, the west side, for example, you may have to take two trains and a bus and walk. Right. So so they are so their whole idea behind this ordinance is to bring the vaccines to the communities that need it the most. Um, and so they talk a lot about that part. You know, it's, it's difficult to say because we haven't seen that implementation. I don't really see a lot of support um, around that that ordinance. Um, so I think it'll be interesting. When I read that ordinance, it, there's a lot of really interesting ideas in terms of how to distribute things. Um, um, one of the one of the members of this uh, network or, or this team talked a lot about uh, vaccine hesitancy in these communities. What happens if there's like a new case of COVID? He says, um, let's create a ring, a vaccination ring where you essentially go into the community where they experience the, the new COVID case and just vaccinate everyone around, right? So there's there's a lot of really smart people, a lot of smart doctors, a lot of smart uh, scholars who have studied um, public health and how to implement this stuff. Um, and so we've covered some of those stories. Uh, it's, it's sort of difficult sometimes to like, understand if, if those are better options, but they're completely different than what we're doing. So I think it's our responsibility to report on those different ideas of how to distribute the vaccine. If, if I could actually follow up on that, uh, do you have hope that lessons we learn uh, for how to deal with some of these inequities, uh, we might learn and apply them to other public health concerns or other concerns going forward? Or do you do you fear that you know, this is something we might just be doing in a crisis and we may return to the standard operating after? Yeah. It's, it's hard to know. I think that the part that's been really interesting for us to deal with is this, I'm trying to like not not to get in trouble. I'm trying to like find the right words. Um, <laughs> it's this thing that happens where you have elected officials really saying, "We really want to have an equitable distribution. We really want to have this, this, and this." 
but it has to be more than just saying it, right? Like it has to be really understanding these communities and really understanding the history of how we got here, right? The Chicago Health Department has had a number of cuts over the years, right? So I was talking to um, a community member um, who is working with the city on um, building these like small vaccination sites as part of this program. Um, and, you know, he was telling me that um, he's working with folks from the uh, a aviation department, right? Because like the, the health department is already so like overworked. And so I think some of the things that we have seen over the last few years in terms of like shifting resources away from public health to other things in the city, right? I think that has had a real impact in the way that this has played out. Um, and I don't know if there is a willingness to to really take a look at the underlying causes, right? For an elected official to say, we're going to create a distribution, you know, um, method which really uses the 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 structure that we're already seeing, right? Like we're using the hospitals, we're using the primary care doctors, we're using the, the pharmacy. If you're saying that, there's already discrepancies, disparities built into that. And I, you know, I'm not in those rooms, so I don't know what is being talked about, but I think that there is this, um, this wish, right? Like. We want to be more equitable. We want to do this. But I wonder if people really understand that, like, it's much more than just saying it. Like, you really have to understand how years and years of disinvestment in communities play out in everything we do. Thank you. Uh, Laura asks, do you know if the statistics in Chicago regarding access and hesitancy are mirrored elsewhere in the country? Is Chicago similar to the rest of the country? Is it different in, in what you're saying? Yeah, I think um, I'm trying to remember. I read this story and I've, I've got COVID brain, so everything's like super hazy. Um, I think that the hesitancy story um, is one that is important, but I've moved away from that because I think that the real story is about distribution, right? Um, and, and a lot of polling kind of showcases that the folks who are more hesitant in getting the vaccine are actually more conservative and whiter. And I think that the, the narrative has really you know, rightly so, initially was about black and brown communities and, and, and you know, they're, they're going to be hesitant to get the vaccine. But I think it is important for us to, like, tell the entire story. It, it was good to have those stories at the beginning, but I think now the story is about distribution. Um, in some ways, Chicago is falls very much in line with the rest of the country um, in, in that way. Um, I personally do not want to do any more stories about hesitancy. I would rather do stories about distribution and what that looks like. It's interesting. I think that there, there might be a, some overlap because uh, you mentioned the hospital that people were hesitant to go to, right? Uh, but that's also, I'm guessing, structural in part two. Uh, could you say more about what was happening in that hospital that made people hesitant? Yeah. Um, so when we did the story that looked at the four zip codes, it was important for us to have some tangible things. And at that point, we were very early into the pandemic. Um, it must have been like May. We started talking about this project around May. And so we really needed to have some parameters that were going to help us really nail down what we wanted to focus on. And so one of the guiding things that we did was um, looking at the the community areas hardest hit. So, you know, we selected the four zip codes based on that. 
And then what we did is that we created a survey. Um, so that we would be asking the same questions of each relative that got at different issues around disparity, right? Like we wanted not our, not even around disparity, but just overall issues. Like we wanted to know where did the person work? Um, did they go to the hospital? Were they tested? How soon after they got tested? You know, like just really basic things. And what we ended up doing is that we collected, I think, 50 responses. And then based on that, um, we, we, we reported on the results. For me, the, the 60623 zip code was really interesting because uh, this the doc, the hospitals that came up the most were two community hospitals, Mount Sinai and uh, St. Anthony Hospital. And these are, you know, community hospitals that treat a lot of, you know, undocumented immigrants, a lot of poor people. And um, the thing that came up the most is that they were afraid to go there or that they felt like there wasn't enough resources. Um, we had some some of the folks that I interviewed basically told me there was no room in the ICU, right? And so I wanted to better understand because for me, it wasn't an it wasn't so much about the accusation as it was really about understanding what was happening in that hospital. And, you know, I'm really grateful to the hospital because they did allow me to go in and interview people and really understand what was going on. And what was going on is that it was a community hospital that was already like struggling financially. And then they get hit with this pandemic and some of the nurses were leaving. Right. And so now they're like, you know, what do we do? Um, and I, um, if you have a chance to listen to the story, I have this like, um, anecdote from one of the nurses who says, like, I got a call and, and from one of the nurses saying, like, we're going to run out of space in the ICU. And by this point, they had extended um, their ICU cap uh, capabilities to another room and they had turned. Um, um, so, yeah, so they were doing the best they could to, like, accommodate the influx of all these uh, community members, right, coming into the hospital. And so I think it's just like a combination of like a financial distress and they were losing people and they were just trying to stay afloat um, and community members not really understanding that like you can't be there, right? And, and some of these community members were so used to going to the hospital with their loved ones, right? To either translate or to advocate for them. And when you remove that, there's a lot of questions about, well, what happened? What happened to my family member? Did, 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 did he get everything he needed? Was she treated right? And so, so I think these are things that um, community members like really talked about. One of the questions in uh, the survey was about um previous experiences with that that same facility and and this came up over and over again they had had like a negative experience and in one of these hospitals feeling like their symptoms weren't treated or feeling like they weren't treated right and so that just really adds to a really difficult situation um and so that's really what happened so for example the 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 man who died in, in his apartment, like I talked to his uh, his daughter, Julie, and she was like, you know, he had um, some chronic illnesses and he had had really negative experiences in, in some of these hospitals and he just did not trust them at all. So I think it's just a combination of like, just feeling like they weren't, treat it well the previous times and 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 we know from surveys as well that some of the hesit uh, vaccine hesitancy that comes from black and brown communities is not so much with the vaccine it's just like they don't really trust the medical industry so much because research shows that a lot of your experiences in the medical community depend on like your skin tone I mean, there's enough research to prove that. So I think that there's, um, it was just a perfect storm for some of these communities, you know. Uh, 
Brian asks, uh, from within the, the Latino community, uh, what can we do to address uh, and debunk conspiracies and, and fears? Yeah, I think um, we're trying to do that um, at BEZ. We are we launched uh, WBEZ in Espanol. We got support from the Pulitzer Center to do more outreach during the vac for the vaccine rollout. Uh, we had a bilingual event um, online, and we partnered with. I think like three community organizations, including the Mexican consulate. And so they streamed it as well in their own social media. So we had like a couple of different people streaming this. And so I think um, at the beginning, it was just really like breaking down information to something that's understandable, right? So our entire event was focused on let's break down this information in a way that is digestible. And so we had some really great um, doctors who have a gift for explaining things in a way that most people can understand. So we had a doctor who literally explained how the vaccine works um, and how it builds immunity, right? Um, because I think there's a lot of fear about that. And uh, so we, we, we did that. Um, we're trying to translate a lot of the articles. We're trying to just provide more information. Um, we partner with community organizations to do the same. I know that um, the city has been doing that as well by partnering with community organizations and really just trying to, you know, continue this peer-to-peer -peer model and, and really kind of building on that. And honestly, that's, that's the only way I think um, it's really hard sometimes to reach this community because um, they're just in different places, you know, and um, it, I think that the bottom line is like reaching them where they're at and, and, and a lot of it is like in their communities. So I think that we need to figure out a better way. And he followed up on that question. Uh, where can we find that bilingual talk slash speech that you referred to? Uh, yeah, so it's uh, WBEZ back I'll, I'll just drop it in the chat in a minute um because i don't know if we have changed it um yeah so we we ended up um we ended up translating um the feature that we have in english which is basically like you put in certain information and it tells you like when you'll be eligible to to get the vaccine um and we also had um like the frequently asked questions um, tab and we've just been trying to you know add as much as possible but it becomes really hard uh, because <laughs> you know I have a full-time job um, reporting these stories and um, and then I have to do this <laughs> and we also want to make sure that we are not only providing useful information, but that we're like copy editing things and that they're great and that we're using the right uh, word because Spanish is spoken in so many different countries. And like we want to make sure that we're using the right word so that, so that the most uh, population can understand what I'm talking about. So it's been it's been a real struggle um, to, to keep it going. Uh, but we we really just believe that uh, public radio should be public to everyone. And, and this is an effort that we that we really believe in. Karen asks, what are some reliable Spanish news sources for people with Spanish speaking families? Yeah, um, the New York Times has some really good um, articles in Spanish. Um, the AP has some articles in Spanish. There's an equivalent of the AP in Spanish. It's called EFE. It's like a wire service. Um, they've got some good stuff. Um, the my. Miami Herald has a Spanish um, language newspaper that I think is really good. And I think it's called an El Nuevo Herald. Um, I would say the really cool thing about the pandemic um, is that a lot of organizations have started translating their work. 
and a lot of news organizations have really started to think about what can we do to service this community as well? So um, I've seen articles, like uh, particularly investigative articles, now being translated into other languages um, so that that information is accessible to that community. So I think that we still have a lot of work to do, but slowly and you know, with more people, and this is the other thing, like in order for us to invest in these things, there has to be an audience. So I, I so like I can talk about my own struggle with this because it's like it's not so much that I'm like translating this, but I'm also thinking about how do we distribute this information once it's translated, once it's there? Like how do I get this information to the community? Because the community is not gonna go to BEZ for that, right? Because it's a, it's an English radio station. So they don't even know to look there. So what we've been doing is we've been just partnering with community organizations to try to get um, our, you know, our stories out. Um, so it's this, it's this weird thing because if you don't see clicks, if you don't see people clicking on this, it's it's really hard for me to make an argument to, to leaders. Hey, this is something that we should invest in. Um, so it, it, it's, it's a little bit hard <laughs> and it can get really overwhelming. So I would say, um, if you have an opportunity to just take a look, um, uh, please take a look, send us feedback. Um, it's not perfect. Um, I'm sh there's a lot of work to be done, but, um, it's honestly the effort is really like from a small group of people in the newsroom uh who are, have taken this on as an additional job um but we really would love some like feedback and uh, if you see any errors please 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 email me <laughs> i'll drop my email in the chat um so yeah thank you and i see that some people are posting sources in the comments uh so that's wonderful um Gaiva, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Um, considering that time flexibility is a privilege, do any ordinances take into consideration working hours and time or support uh, for recovery from any negative side effects of the vaccine? Yeah, that's an issue that is, um, I'm really glad you brought it up because it, this t the luxury of time question is actually one that really expands on a, on a number of issues. Um, one, because I'm thinking about this as I'm working on this uh, story that I'm that I'm working on right now, um, the luxury of time to go chase the vaccine. So, for example, like if you can go to another community to go get vaccinated, that's a luxury. And um, the ordinance that I was referencing earlier actually has some language about. Um, the need for the city and the state to have vaccination sites at jobs, right? So people who deliver, like people who work at Amazon, for example, people who work in food uh, processing, like we need them because we relied on them the entire time. They don't have the time to go chase this vaccine. And we've seen that manufacturing, at least in, at least in Illinois, manufacturing and warehousing have the most COVID cases outside of nursing homes. And so we really do see that like time in that aspect is a luxury. Um, I'm sorry, th the other part of that question was um, time. Uh, so, so if there were side effects to the vaccine, given oh. that you might need time to recover as well. <sighs> right. So we see that low wage workers don't really have uh, paid time off. Um, a lot of the people that I've uh, interviewed and talked to who work in um, some of these warehouses are actually hired through temp agencies. So temp agencies do not offer, you know, paid time off. They don't offer really anything. Um, and so it is, it is hard for them to be able to to do this work. In fact, um, I'm going to be covering uh, something later on today that deals with some of the warehouse workers in um, a bread uh, producing like plant outside of Chicago and uh, some of the other warehousing. And what 
the workers are demanding is like hazard pay. Like I'm risking my life to go and produce this, this good that you're saying is needed, right? But you're not paying me extra. So there's, I think there's like a real effort uh, by unions, by workers um, who really understand that they are essential and that we do need them. We need them to get our packages. We need them to, to eat, really. Um, and I think that there's, you see this with the unionizing efforts in, in Amazon and, and the South, um, but there's a, a real concern now for, for workers to be able to have hazard pay, to be able to, to be compensated for the time that they spent if they got infected at work. I can't tell you how many people I've interviewed who work um, in a staffing agency who got sick because they went, they, they were sent to a food processing plant or they were sent to um, a warehouse and they got sick and they never got paid for that time that they had to take off, you know? And um, so I think it's an issue that is becoming a lot more visible. And I think that the more it happens, we, we are starting to hear more from workers and unions really vocalizing that like this has to stop it. They need some protection. They need some additional payment for going to these plants and, and really risking their health. Thank you. Uh, Dustin asks, how can we decide which info is trustworthy on the vaccine and which isn't trustworthy? Yeah, um, I think that if you, whenever you look at an article or a post, um, I would say just treat it like you would treat anything in your life. Where is it coming from? Is, is it a reliable source? Is it a government source? Is it coming from a university? Is it coming from a trusted news organization? What is the content of what is saying? Where is it coming from, right? Like just really being um, intentional about your news diet, right? The same way that you would that you would say, oh, should I eat this? This is not great. Uh, it's the same way that I would say navigating the internet has become really difficult and really challenging. And I think that you should be uh, really patient with yourself, but also be really intentional about questioning where is this information coming from does it make sense is there proof show me the proof show me the the facts right because anyone can say you know the craziest thing but like where are you where is this coming from right and so i think that the more that we become really intentional about questioning like where is this coming from what is this the better consumers of news that will become. And there's a number of resources. I'm, I'm happy to email um, some of those, but there's been an effort by a lot of uh, news organizations uh, to add things that sort of, you know, tell you where everyone got the information. Um, I know in my uh, investigations particularly, we have, we shared the methodology because we believe that transparency is needed for people to trust us, right? That they know exactly what we FOIA'd, that they know exactly how we analyze the data, that, that they know exactly how we fact check that information, right? So I think that um, it does require more on your part. And I understand that in, in, in a world that demands your attention in so many different ways, it can be really overwhelming, but it is really important to take on that responsibility. And honestly, it's, it's also powerful for you to say, there is a world of information out there. I have access to all of these things. You have access to every, um, every document that an agency produces, any database that an agency produces. All of those things are open to the public. We have this wonderful law in the US It's called the Freedom of Information Act request. You can file it. You can ask for any information from your government. I really encourage you to look into it, use it, 
because it's important for communities to be involved in government. Secrets are not good for us. I really believe that transparency is the way for all of us to move forward. Any other questions? I'd like to type them into the chat or if you would prefer to speak it, that's fine too. Uh, while we're waiting on that, I think it's interesting because uh, your response to that question to me sort of dovetails with the earlier question about uh, time being a privilege, right? Um, the, the, you know, filing the FOIA request, um, going through the information once you get it takes a lot of time that you know working people often don't have. Uh, and so uh, your, your first part of that response about you know, finding some sources that you can count on that you know show their work and not just ask you to take their word for it becomes really important. Mm -hmm. I also I, I agree with you in terms of privilege, but I also think that it is really empowering when you say, no, like I have the agency to question your reporting. I have the agency to say that doesn't look that doesn't look accurate. Like, let me take a look. And I think that it doesn't have to be an additional thing that you have to do. You can actually just be like, you know what? There was something that happened in City Hall that I just did not like. Let me go look into it. And like it empowers you to be more, you know, um, engaged with your local leaders because the vast majority of what happens um, doesn't only happen at the federal level. There are dozens of, you know, community meetings, um, planning, development, taxing. Um, there's a number of things that happen in your community that directly impact you. And I really believe that in order for you to be involved, it does require some time, but it's time that you're investing in your community. It's you uh, really like taking that power and saying, I'm not going to be just like a bystander. I'm going to really be involved in this and I want to know what they're doing and I want to know why they're doing it, and I want to know why they're giving the contract to this, you know, person versus this other person. And I want to know why they decided to, you know, build this, um, this thing in this neighborhood versus this other neighborhood, right? Like those kinds of decisions are made because nobody's really looking, right? Like they're making these decisions and nobody really knows. And so in some areas, like Chicago has a lot of journalists, <laughs> so we're we're great here, but there are some communities, like there are some suburbs outside of Chicago that I'm like, I wish I had more time to like go to these community meetings and understand what's happening. But there's only very few journalists because of the downtime, you know, the downturn in the economy. We've lost a lot of them. So I really would love to see more um, community members doing that work because you don't need to be a reporter to do that work. You can file a freedom of information request by yourself, you know, like something that you want to find out. You want to know why um, there is uh, a stop. Or, or you want to stop here, but there's no stop. Like there's a number of things that you could do. Um, and I really think that um, it, it does take some time, but it's also really empowering because you're taking ownership in your community. And it's work that people don't have to do on their own either. Uh, they can organize with others to, to make that lighter work. Uh, and, and so you've inspired some people here. P people are wanting to know uh, how you go about uh, filing Freedom of Information Act requests. Okay, I <laughs> love I love this. Um, OK, so. Every agency, state, local or state, city, county, federal. Ev basically any agency that produces any document has to be able to provide it to community members. So let's say that you wanted to. Um, get the uh, contracts that are that are, let, let me take that back. Let's say that you wanted to know which companies were doing business with the city of Chicago. You could file a freedom of information request and get a list of all the contracts that the city has signed with 
a private company, right? And let's say that you wanted to understand like, well, how many of these agencies or these companies gave money to the current mayor? All of that stuff is up publicly available. Technically, the only thing that you have to do when you file a freedom of information request is describe what you want um, and then submit it. It's as simple as that. Most places will not honor your freedom of information request unless you're like serious about it. So what I like to tell people is um, there's a, a website and I'll, I'll drop it on here, but um, it's called um, Mockrock. And so you can kind of see some of the um, the freedom of information requests that have been filed. And um, you can kind of take some of the language from there as well um, to use it for your own uh, freedom of information request. I would say if you are going to, to submit one, to be really specific, as specific as possible, because agencies will look for any reason to not give you the information, okay? Trust me. So you want to be really specific. Do you want an email or whatever? Then don't request two, three years. You'll never get it. Try and really think about which person or what period of time do I want so that I'm able to get something back. So be really strategic about the things that you request. But you know it's um it's it's great like you can you can even use it for your own work like let's say that you are contesting a ticket and you wanted to get some document or let's say that you were you had a claim with your insurance company and you needed to get like a copy of like code enforcement violations like all of those things are open to you they're your records you know and the more that you use this law I think the more uh, transparent um, agencies will become because they'll have to do it. You know, they'll have to turn over records. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Annalena is asking again: uh, How would you break barriers between family members or friends in the context of fighting vaccine conspiracy theories? What if they're set in the idea? Uh, that those conspiracies are true. How would you combat that misinformation as a relative or a friend? Yeah, I think it's really important for you to be in a mental space where you can be really compassionate and really patient. Because if you argue with someone, they're just not, they're not going to hear you because they're going to be waiting for you to stop talking so that they can say something, right? And that's usually where all communication goes to die. <laughs> and so you have to be, one of the two people has to be the adult in the room, right? So you have to really be patient and understand why this person is feeling this way and maybe address some of the, like really kind of question in, in a gentle way, like, okay, you believe this. Okay, I understand. So let's go over it and talk about it and let them, talk and talk and talk and in some cases they hear that some of those things don't make sense but you have to be really patient and you have to provide information you have to really question like where did that come from or or why are you feeling this upset or what like what is behind this Right. And you have to kind of like gently guide them. And it, it may not take one conversation. It may take several. It may take months, you know, because some people are not ready to hear you. And that's OK. You just keep chip, you know, chipping away, you know, and maybe they'll come around. Do we have any last questions? I'm just trying to see if I miss any other questions. I think there was one earlier that I did skip over. I wasn't sure if it was within the scope of your research or not. Um, how, how about people that have had the virus? They may be long haulers or not. Uh, how would the vaccine work for them? Does, does the vaccine, I assume, take? 
Yeah, so uh, the New York Times has done really great reporting on this. Um, uh, they've done some reporting about um, not only the the long haulers, um, but also the ways in which the vaccine has actually helped some of them uh, recover. And uh, so I would defer to to some of the reporting that the New York Times has done. Also, uh, Northwestern University just released a study that looks at the long lasting impact of COVID-19 on, on some patients. So I, I would say, like, look at at, at that research. Um, I think that the, the most challenging part about reporting on the story is that the virus is so new and the science keeps changing and the science is just sort of like, we're, we're just trying to, to keep everyone informed. And you may remember, like initially the CDC said, you don't have to wear a mask if you don't have symptoms. That's clearly changed. So I think that um, it's important to just kind of like keep going back to these sources and see what the new research says, because that's really where, um, where all of this is going to come from. And um, it's, it's sometimes it's hard to keep up, but um, I think the New York Times has done an amazing job like covering some of those really nuanced uh, stories around uh, the vaccine. Um, there was this like one story um, that looked at a long hauler um, who was having a hard time like recovering the sense of smell. Um, and there was like some other folks who had had like really long lasting like um, side effects of COVID-19. And surprisingly, getting the vaccine for them turned out to be like a game changer. Um, but again, like the, the research is really new. I don't know that they've done any research on that. I think that the, the newer research, the one that I saw from Northwestern was just really saying there are people who don't recover in a couple of weeks. There are people who have like long lasting impact. So I, I, I'm sure that the science will, will catch up, you know, because a lot of these scientists are doing the research right now. So it, it does take a while. So we'll, we'll just, we'll just wait and see. Any last questions? All right, all right, well, I don't think we have any more questions, but uh, thank you all so much for having me. This has been really fun. Um, again, if you are able to file a FOIA just for yourself, like just to see that you can do it, go for it, do it. <laughs> because it like, you get such a sense of power, right? Of like, yes, this d these are my taxpayer dollars. Like I deserve to know what's going on and you know, you'd be surprised at the kinds of things that you're, you know, that you're able to discover. So I really encourage you all to to actively participate in, in your government. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate you, your being with us today. Thank you so much. Please stay healthy. You as well. Okay, bye. Bye.